of the Department of Economics and Finance, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our 33rd annual Henry George Lecture at the University of Scranton. I would also like to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Dave Donaldson, Professor of Economics at MIT. Before I introduce our speaker this evening, I would like to acknowledge the Robert Sackerman Foundation for the generous financial support without which this event would not be possible. As an elected member of the Robert Sackerman Foundation, I came to appreciate the interest and efforts of the board to promote and disseminate the Henry George ideas, as well as to collaborate with the University of Scranton for that purpose. Tonight, we are honored to have with us additional members of the Foundation's Board of Directors, Mrs. Wynne Akebach and her husband, Joe, who have traveled from Delaware to be part of this event. We're also happy to have with us tonight the Program Director and former board member of the Robert Sakeba Foundation, Brendan Hennigan, who drove all the way from Canada. Thank you all again for your continued support. I would also like to recognize our departmental faculty, specifically the Henry George Committee, whose members are Drs. Ed Skehill, Chair of the Committee, John Kalanyotis, Sada Gigos, Aram Balagizian, Jihan Kai, John Radi, uh, and myself. In addition, I would like to thank the ODE chapter students for their assistance. Finally, this event would not be possible without the help of our department's administrative assistant, uh, Ms. Janice Mekadon, whose work ensures that we have a, a successful Henry George event every year. Thank you all for your hard work and commitment. Our Henry George Lecture Series continues the tradition of attracting excellent speakers. This year's Nobel Prize in Economics has been awarded to two economists. One of those was our 2003 Henry George guest speaker, Paul Romer, bringing the total number of Nobel laureates in economics who delivered the Henry George Lecture here at the university to 11. Professor Donaldson, please don't feel any pressure. Before I formally introduce our speaker this evening, I would like to uh, uh, invite to the podium the program director uh, and former board member of the Robert Sackerman Foundation, Brendan Hennigan, who will present you with uh, uh, information about the foundation and also uh, Henry George. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah, you got, can you understand me? <laughs> well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Brendan Hennigan, and I'm the program director of the Robert Schackenbach Foundation. Our edit office is in Manhattan, New York. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Department of Economics and Finance here at the University of Scranton, especially uh, Professor Ed um, Scarhill and Jordan Petras, and the Department Henry George Committee, Administration Assistant Janice Mac uh, Macadon, and you, you the students and staff at the University of Sc uh, Scranton. So everybody give themselves a big hand of applause for being here tonight. <laughs> so you might be asking yourself, who is Robert Schleckenbach and Henry George. So we'll quickly give you a little bit of that information. Well, uh, Robert Schleckenbach was uh, a publisher and he was a follower of Henry, Henry George. Um, he was a, a, his goal and aim of our foundation is to promote awareness of the social and eco economic reforms advocated by Henry George. If a hundred years ago, you mentioned the name Henry George, everybody would know the person you talk about, whether it was in the US, whether it was in Ireland, the UK, China, he was a very well-known figure. He was born in Philadelphia in 1839. He was a successful San Francisco journalist from the 1850s to 70s, and he wrote his famous book, Progress and uh, Poverty. What I admire about him was he was also an orator and he had the power and the love of English and the English language to express his thoughts and ideas. He was a political economist, social reformer and tax reformer and he died in 1897. The Robert Schackenbach Foundation um, produces books, materials, 
And one of our achievements is to do the annotated works of Henry George. So what do you mean by the annotated works? Surprisingly, this critical edition was many years in, um, in its formation. But if you're a researcher or you're an economist and you want to quote from Henry George, you go to the crit critical edition. So we're, we've, we're producing that. We produced three volumes of a six-volume set. Um, our last volume was Social Problems and the Conditions of Labour. And our next volume to come out in the spring, surprisingly, is Protection or Free Trade, the topic of, of tonight. He also got two other books, The Science of Political Economy and The um, uh, Perplexed Philosopher. Now, I do have some books um, for a very reasonable goodwill price, very reasonable price, and some handout materials, so we'll be back at the, there late, later on for you. Now, it, our talk is on trade, and this is the um, October issue of the Bloomsburg um, um, Business News. And this was one of the articles, the lead articles. The administration uh, aluminium tariff raises prices, hurts US manufacturing, and causes chaos all around the world. Other than that, it's great. So, you, you know, so, so that was um, an article going in. in um, Professor Davidson's home country, Canada, and, and my, um, my country as, as well. The Financial Post done um, articles on, um, this, on, on the World Trade Organization, and now the middle powers, 13 middle powers, have just met in Ottawa to talk about trade, but the US and China wasn't invited to this meeting, the meeting again in January, because they know that free trade is very important and we'll be learning about that through this lecture tonight later on. So, let's talk about Henry George. He wrote the book, Protection of Free Trade. And it's online and I've got some copies and I would ask you to read that, because his purpose was to give a clear idea of what the issues were. Quoting, my effort in short has been to make such a candid and thorough examination of the tariff question to prevent the division into hostile camps of those common purposes ought to unite to, to regard others as natural antagonists. Why do we argue, why do people get into argue about free trade, protectionism, when we should be working together? You know, George's main idea is, is that cooperation in society is fundamental to go along with, with the idea of justice as well. I've got a few more quotes, uh, quotes here. I won't read them out, out, but basically George was a free trader. And, and he makes the, the, the case for free trade and, and tells you also in his book why protectionism um, is, is, is important to understand and why people wrongly are drawn to those ideas. His basic question is this, even with free trade, the eliminating of, of barriers, you'll still have a problem and it's what our foundation tries to promote, the old idea of how you tax people. And he said, a tax on land value is, is of all taxes that which best fulfills every requirement of a perfect tax. These are my, my last slide and these are a few quotes about what free trade. Free trade means free production so that you're allowed to, to invest in yourself and, and in the country and uh, exchange. But true free trade, in short, requires that the Arctic active factor of production, labor, shall have free access to the passive factor of production, land. He goes on to say, true free trade leads only to the largest production of wealth, but to the fairest distribution. And in conclusion, Emmy's, Emmy George's ideas are not dead. We would like to say, what is the legacy of Henry George? Well, Henry George fell in a fair distribution of wealth. He, he, when we talk about in, inequality today, he talked about it in, in his own day. He did present an alternative to our present complex tax system. He wanted to simplify it. He did present a model to achieve smaller government. And he did illustrate why an ethical component cannot um, be separated from an economic 
reality. For the last 100 years, that separation of the ethics and economics has been the standard form. And I think we're seeing today that we need to look at the ethical component of e e economics. And most importantly, he advocates for economic and social justice. That I would like to, um, I'll be at the back of the hall to talk to you more about Henry George. And it's a real pleasure to be on the same stage as um, Professor David uh, Davidson. Um, the topic tonight is trade, and I'm so excited I'm going to sit in my seat and take every word in. So thank you very much, and thank you for inviting us here. Thank you, Brendan. Um, our speaker tonight, Professor Donaldson, is involved in research that examines the welfare and other effects of market integration, the impact of uh, improvements in transportation infrastructure, how trade might medi mediate the effects of climate change, and how trade affects food security and um, uh, uh, famine. He received the 2017 John Bates Clark Medal, which is given by the American Economic Association to the US-based economist under the age of 40, who is just to have made the most significant contribution to economic thought and knowledge. His publications include non-parametric counterfactual predictions in neoclassical models of international trade in the American Economic Review, the view from above, applications of satellite data and economics in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, and involving comparative advantage in the, in the impact of climate change in agricultural markets, evidence from 1.7 million fields around the world in the general political economy. His research has been supported by an Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship and several grants from the National Science Foundation. Dr. Donaldson serves as a co-editor at the American Economic Journal, Applied Economics, as an editorial board member of the Journal of Economic Literature, and the Journal of International Economics, and as a program director for trade at the International Growth Center. Dr. Uh, Donaldson earned his undergraduate degree in physics from Oxford University and his master and PhD degrees in economics from the Ro London School of Economics. The title of this evening lecture is Should We Embrace Protectionism? The Evidence Behind the Case for Free Trade. Protectionism versus free trade is a very important topic in the field of international economics. It's also a timely topic given the recent U.S. impositions of tariffs on imported goods. Tonight's lecture will shed light on the debate about free trade versus protectionism and the potential consequences of the latter, such as trade wars. Professor Donaldson will also present evidence whether or not openness to trade can lead to higher levels of economic growth, something that has been also debatable but uh, eco international economists are, are very um, um, uh, on top of this in, when it, it comes to empirical research. You have a, the opportunity to, to ask questions. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the lecture. So please join me in giving a warm a welcome, a scrum welcome to Professor Dave Donaldson. Yeah, yeah. That's your water. Um, well, thank you. Sorry, forgot again. Thank you very much for that, as well as for the chance to be here. I, I hope it's completely obvious to you all what an honor it would be for any economist um, to be associated with this, with the name of Henry George, with this uh, tradition. And you know, I'm the first, uh, the highest in that order of sort of the to which it's an honor. Uh, it's also just been a pleasure being part of this community today. I'm very jealous of uh, the community you've built here. It's um, it's it's a very remarkable thing. Uh, so today I'll be talking, as you've heard, about uh, uh, protectionism and the evidence that economists have been able to offer 
I don't want to claim it's watertight. I don't want to claim we know everything that we wish we knew. I don't want to claim that the issues are easy to answer and easy to address. But I'll kind of tell you what we know and, um, and, and leave it to you to, to uh, kind of join us on the, 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 the journey of trying to learn more. Um, so this is a picture that I'm sure will bring back happy memories for many of us, uh, uh, you know, which of course reminds us that these issues are not simple. And, um, and reasonable people can, can disagree about them. And that's actually a, a, you know, something that, that struck me at a, at a young age um, when I saw this picture. It wasn't pixelated when I saw it, uh, but it is now um, at your resolution. Um, does anyone know who these gentlemen are? <laughs> Other than you, <laughs> you're cheating. Yes, so that's Brian Mulroney, uh, who became Prime Minister of Canada, and this is the opponent uh, of his uh, 1988 national, uh, you know, prime ministerial debate, uh, John Turner. And they were debating whether Canada should join uh, the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, which of course became NAFTA by uh, 1991. And this debate, this prime ministerial debate, this federal election debate, basically played out around this question, should Canada um, you know, sign up to a free trade agreement with its big, uh, economically scary and powerful neighbor to the south. And um, Brian Mulroney won the election. Uh, Canada joined the Canada-US free trade agreement. But the, of course, the debates in Canada as elsewhere still, still rage on. Um, uh, you know, so to economists, that's a little bit surprising. This is a, um, an, an, the results of an initiative uh, run by the University of Chicago a Booth School of Business called the, um, the, the IGM Economic Experts Panel, where they poll, uh, you know, every few couple of weeks they pose a question to a panel of, um, of, of well-chosen uh, ec expert uh, research economists in, in, in this domain. And in uh, March 2012, they posed this question, uh, uh, you know, effectively poses a statement to which you would either, either agree or disagree about whether free trade is in the long run leads to gains that are, um, that are, uh, that are sizable, that are positive and sizable. And as you can see, there's tremendous agreement among this panel of experts for whatever you think that's worth. Uh, the agreement is actually stronger on this issue than I've actually, I think, ever seen uh, in the many weeks, many, many years that have passed since this, they posed this topic, uh, than I've seen them pose on any topic, any other topic. So it's something about, you know, which, about which economics tend to agree, and, and I'm going to talk today about why that's the case, and, um, and I'm also going to talk about some of the, um, the, the counter arguments. So that is to say, I'm going to start with a sort of basic recap of the, the theoretical, you know, um, logical argument for free trade, which is going to be, which is going to involve, um, you know, some of the, some of the thinking that, uh, that started with Adam Smith and, and uh, David Ricardo about 200 years ago. It's, a, it's a, obviously a theory that's been developed many, many, many times since over the ensuing centuries, but I'll try to give you the, the, the kernel of an insight that people attribute first to Ricardo. Um, I'll then kind of walk through a quantitative version of that. So the, the, this point number one is really just, it's, it's, it's sort of qualitative theory. It's, it's asking, you know, should we expect um, opening to trade between two countries to be good or bad, you know, positive or negative. It doesn't tell you how positive or how negative, right? So I'll try to sort of just show you a little bit of a flavor of some work I've done with a colleague of mine named Arno Costino, uh, where we tried to put some what we thought as sort of you know plausible numbers, numbers you can believe in hopefully on uh, the Ricardian forces for the gains from trade in the context of uh, U.S. agriculture, and we're going to sort of run that for 120 years from 1880 to the present, and try to ask, you know, how big were those Ricardian forces in that case? You know, just one case, a case that I'll try to explain why we chose it. Then I'll sort of, I'll, I'll, I'll describe, you know, since those are basically theoretical arguments, I'll, I'll describe to you some of the well-known counter-theoretical arguments that I, that I think are, that are important and that we need more evidence on. Um, and sort of, and hence sort of pose it to you as basically, you know, this is a, this is a question about which theory, you know, like so many questions, uh, just cannot be guaranteed to, to lead us to necessarily the right answer. And that's where raw data on raw episodes where countries opened up to trade is where, what, something we can learn from. And so I'll talk about that. I'll talk about sort of last sort of some of that evidence. And, and as I warned you in advance, I mean, this is by no means, um, uh, the, we, we don't have access to the kinds of experiments that would 
would really nail this, you know, and, and so, but I'll, I'll lay bare what I think we know. Um, okay, so on to the theory, Ricardo. Uh, so this is, and it just, Ricardo kind of wrote in, uh, you know, in a beautiful 1817 book uh, about many, many, many things, and, and deep in that book was uh, the following example, which has gone down in history as the first sort of coherent example of where you could kind of see uh, the gains in trade between two countries, two regions, two people, if you like, uh, at work. And his example looked like this, um, essentially, and it was uh, the, the great economist um, uh, Paul Samuelson called these Ricardo's four magic numbers, because they really make you think about this. So what are these numbers? Well, uh, in Ricardo's language, he said, well, let's strip this down to the simplest possible example I can tell you about. So he said, let's imagine two countries. He was uh, a Portuguese man living in England, so the two countries to, to pick were obvious. Um, two major uh, you know, tradable commodities produced by those two countries at that, that time were cloth and wine. Cloth being, just think of sort of basic textile products. Uh, wine being wine, and he he said, you know, I think a reasonable uh, guess. He he was actually sort of an investor, or a business person. You know, I thought his he, you know his guesses might actually be relatively informed. Uh, you know, but this was meant to be an example anyway. But let's let's talk about it. A reasonable guess of, of, as to how many workers it would take to make a unit. What's a unit? It doesn't matter. So just call it a unit of cloth. Um, and he said, let's, let's imagine that that number, for England, let's just pick a round number, like 100. Just so obviously that, pick, if we pick 200, we'd just change the units, right? So let's pick 100. Um, and he said, well, you know, the problem with England is it takes, uh, it takes 100 workers to produce a unit of cloth, but it only takes in Portugal 90 workers, right? So the Portuguese are better at making cloth. Let's turn to wine. You know, England with their um, Yorkshire weather, uh, you know, is not the, the most productive place to produce wine. Uh, when they try to make wine, it takes a lot of workers to do a good job, and it takes fully 120 workers to produce a unit of wine, whereas in Portugal, as you know, um, wine is, uh, is pretty easy to grow well, and so let's say it only takes 80 workers to produce that unit. Okay, so those, this is just an example, four numbers. The exact values of these numbers don't matter, the rankings don't matter, the point completely generalizes, we now know all those statements are true. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna sort of try to plot those numbers on a picture uh, that's important for some of the things I'm gonna say next, which, uh, so bear with me. This is what economists call the production possibilities frontier. Uh, on the left is the frontier for England, on the right is the frontier for Portugal. And what the frontier tells you is um, all the possible permutations, so if, if you had sort of, you know, a fixed amount of workers in England, like let's say, you know, um, 100 workers, this tells you the, all the permutations of either wine or cloth or a bit of both that you could produce with access to those four numbers, the, the sort of the, the hypothetical capabilities that Ricardo talked about as the, um, the, their capabilities of producing. So this is kind of like a menu of what could be produced. The left there is the menu of what England could produce on the left. And, and of course, you, the England would never want to be like inside the frontier. They would, you know, that would be like wasting some of the, the talent. They would always make sure they're on the frontier uh, using all the workers, but exactly where is absolutely not pinned down. There would be, you know, what's the notion of a good or a bad mixture of wine or cloth? We'd have to go and think harder about it, and that's what I'll talk about next. Okay, so it's a set of possibilities. Likewise, for Portugal, the possibilities exist as well. You'll notice the possibilities are of different slopes. That's essential to the argument here. And basically, all the slopes being different tells us is that England is relatively better uh, at, you know, as you'll notice in this example, England is worse at both but they're relatively better at, um, at cloth than they are at, at wine, relative to Portugal. Okay, so that's why the slope is steeper uh, in, in Portugal, basically. They, um, they have to give up a lot of wine to produce their, their cloth. England has to give up um, less wine to produce a unit of cloth. Okay, so I'm gonna now kind of shift gears to a different picture that is the global possibilities, production possibilities frontier, PPF. And um, this is the entire world's possibilities. So we, on the y-axis is still the, the wine, on the x-axis is still the cloth, but now it's the world's wine and the world's cloth. Okay, so why is this different? Well, now we're basically just saying, what could the world produce? And here is, is where things, I think, get more interesting. So there's four red dots there that are illustrative. They tell you how much of the, where the world would be producing in this picture if 
for example, both were producing wine. Obviously, then we would be on that kind of y-axis, and the uh, at the you know at the point at which you know we know that would basically be. Um, in the example, it would be uh, if there's one worker per country, sorry, uh, 200 workers in the world, that would be a two units of wine produced in the world. So y you get the idea, that's the top left is if both produce wine, bottom right is if both produce cloth, and then there's these two kind of points in the middle, and that's where comparative advantage comes in, is a phrase you may have heard of. If the countries specialize according to what they're relatively good at, that is if England makes the world's cloth, all of it, and Portugal makes the world's wine, all of it, then they would be at the kind of the, the, t the highest red dot up to the kind of northeast, the upper right of the picture. Whereas if they were to flip and sort of not do things according to comparative advantage, then they would be uh, inside that world frontier. They would be at that inner red dot where England is making the world's wine. It's a, you know, a scary thought that the England would make the world's wine, but, but as you can see, it leads to scary consequences. A, a equally scary is Portugal making the world's cloth. Both of those things lead to the fact that the world, that if that was happening, the, the world is not producing as much as it could. The world has, in a sense, a fixed amount of labor, and we're just sort of, when we're moving the red dot, the, the production dot around that picture, we're basically just asking how much cloth, how much wine could the world make as a whole based on how we specialize internationally. And as you can see, there's some good specializations, like let's both make wine, or let's both make cloth, or let's mix it up, where England makes the world's cloth and Portugal makes the wine. But there's a terrible specialization, which is where we specialize in you know, anti-comparative advantage. And this was the example that, um, that, uh, that Ricardo came up with. He further proved that, you know, that, that this tells you the world's output is bigger if there's, if there's trading, if there's specialization, that you know, we, could, we could do a lot worse uh, if we weren't trading. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily show that both both countries would benefit from that, but he, he pointed out that, you know, countries have the option to not trade, so, you know, they, they, they can completely replicate what they could do at home, um, or they could choose to trade, and if they choose to trade, they're specializing, that would be, end up ending up on the world PPF and not inside the world PPF. So from the world perspective, this is good, and from each individual country's perspective, this is good. A related picture is, is this one, which is where we bring in a third country, let's call it France. Let's imagine that it happens to have a third number that's intermediate between England's extreme uh, inability to produce wine and Portugal's in extreme inability to produce cloth, relatively speaking. This just adds a third dot to that world PPF. Right? Let's now add an infinite number of countries. It looks like this. There's a whole continuum of countries. Maybe that's, not, maybe that's actually a good picture because we know countries are not like dots in space, right? They're, they're spatial units. Maybe land uh, is truly continuous. And in this example, there will be bits of land that are good at cloth and good at, are not so good at wine and vice versa. And we can always kind of just basically generalize that argument I previously showed you and draw the worldwide PPF. So against that backdrop, let me now try to finally show you this, which is sort of uh, going to lead to what I talk about in the case of the data, which is um, a related picture. So let's now imagine that actually there's two countries, each of which have within them a sort of continuum of land. So that's going to lead those within country PPFs to be curved, right? So one country has a sort of relatively steep curve. That's the country to the top left uh, in blue. There's another country that has a relatively shallow curve. That's a bit like an English country, not so good at wine on average, pretty good at cloth on average. They're the one to the top, the bottom right. And um, the beautiful thing about this picture is you can see right away that the, those two dots, I've just kind of chosen them as possible allocations here. They're, they're both on the country's PPF. They're not outside the country's PPFs. But this is, a, this is where you can kind of see the gains to each country in, in, in broad daylight. So if the, if the England were to produce to the top left, and, or sorry, if, if uh, Portugal were to produce to the top left and England were to produce to the, to the top right at those two red dots, then it would be possible for them to sort of trade along that red line. That would be like a set, that red line illustrates a set of equal swaps where it's kind of like for every, you know, uh, one unit of wine I give you, you agree to give me, uh, you know, X units of, of cloth. That, that, that line sort of tells you it's a, it's a line of constant trade sort of swap values or kind of price line if you like. And this tells us that it's possible, we know it's physically possible for those countries to trade and, and, and achieve any allocation after trade that's anywhere on that red line. And as you can see, the beautiful thing about that red line is it's effectively pushing out the frontier from the perspective of each country. So it's giving them kind of consumption possibilities that are strictly greater than their raw pre-trade production possibilities were. And it's that that kind of is basically the core of the gains from trade. You know, you, you can, to each country, you can either, you know, you can, you can stick and produce and you can consume 
consume what you produce, and that's being like consuming at the red dot. Or you could find another country that's a little different from you, they produce at their red dot, and we trade in between, and it opens up possibilities that weren't available before. And that's the, that's the basic core argument to, to economists about why we think that, uh, you know, that trade should be beneficial on the whole. Um, so let me finally show one last kind of one of these red dot figures, uh, which is this one, which is to imagine we were to start kind of like it, to the red dots that are um, not at the, where the red line is. They're sort of they're the most interior red dots. So these are feasible on the frontier production allocations for the countries. But imagine now you were to see a world where the red dots are moving. So the, the, the red dots on the Portugal to the left are moving up. The red dots on the, on the English one are moving to the right. They're moving out towards that kind of red line. They're out, moving out to the case where the gains from trade are maximizing. So that's a case where this set of countries, these two countries, would start to look increasingly productive uh, in terms of what they're producing, in terms of what consumers value, over time just from the fact that they're, they're, they're not, the PPF is fixed. They're not, they're not changing their possibilities. They're just changing the way they trade with each other. They're changing sort of the way, the, where they produce enables them to make better trades that lead to better consumption possibilities. And that, I think, is a, is a pretty good metaphor for um, you know, some aspects of history, that basically when it was costly to trade, countries were at points on their PPFs that weren't sort of at maximizing the trade possibilities where that red line is. They were sort of inside it. But as various forces made it easier to trade, they, they were able to get closer to the point where the consumption possibilities are, are maximized, where Portugal is going up into the wine domain and getting out of cloth, and England is going into the cloth domain and getting out of wine. And that's good for the world as a whole, this, this two-country world. Um, OK, so that's, the, uh, that's what I'm now going to ask. Um, you know, I've asked myself many times uh, the question, you know, Fine, I see these diagrams in my textbook. You've now seen them in, uh, you know, on a Friday night, of all places. And, um, and you're, you're, you're surely asking yourself, you know, what, is this effect big or small? And that was a question that um, motivated um, you know, my colleague Arnaud and, and me to work on, um, on that question, which is sort of putting numbers on Ricardo, let's call it. So uh, let me walk you through that. So, um, Jordan mentioned my interest in satellite-based uh, economics data. This is sort of an example of that. So, um, you know, the problem with Ricardo's four numbers is that they're hypothetical. And they're not just hypothetical because he was telling us an example. They're like doubly hypothetical because he was telling us, in a sense, you know, England wasn't producing wine to, to all intents and purposes by the time of Ricardo's writing. He was just sort of, you know, speculating about how bad they would be at it if they were to make it, that's sort of roughly speaking. So the problem with Ricardo's four magic numbers is that you know, one of them, at least one of them, possibly two of them, we're not going to know. We're, there's no, there's, in principle, there's no way you could know them. Um, OK, so that's what led Arnaud and me to think about, well, where's a setting where we might try to, you know, might be able to get a window on those numbers. And we were led to uh, the field, uh, this, the ag economic sector of agriculture and the scientific field of agronomy, or so-called crop science, which is, you know, basically one of their goals is to offer farmers Ricardo's menu, to basically, you know, go to a farmer in a setting, look at his or her soil and his or her climate in their vicinity, and, uh, and, of course, things like the availability of fertilizer and irrigation, et cetera, and tractors, and say, okay, fine, you know, given all that, what I know about your situation, Mr. Farmer, here's what I think is your menu of sort of productivities of how good you could be at, for example, in this picture, wheat. So this comes from the Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO's uh, GAEZ project. Um, and they do this for the whole world, and I'm just showing you the slice through America in this picture. So this is just kind of, this is not data, this is made up, uh, you know, this is made up data by agronomists where they take their carefully calibrated through, you know, crop cutting field experiments, agronomic model, and put into it the, what they know about their model for wheat, and put into it for each pixel in this picture in the United States, put into it what they know about the soil at that pixel, and the climate at this pixel, and the topography at the pixel, et cetera, et cetera. And so they come up with this sort of production capacity um, for, you know, if that pixel were to grow wheat and nothing brought wheat, this is what they would expect the yield to be. You know, under some uh, maintained assumptions about the growing other inputs, like uh, you know, modern tractor equipment, modern irrigation if necessary, and modern fertilizers, uh, use of modern fertilizers optimally. 
So it's, you know, it's, a, it's obviously an idealized world. Every individual farmer will you know, have her own tale to tell. But, uh, but I think it, you know, it probably does you know, a reasonable job at sort of cutting through a lot of the basic features of how we think the land is heterogeneous, right? I mean, it's the, it's the heterogeneity of land that gave rise to this uh, curved picture, right? And just like it's that, it's the fact that every parcel of land in this infinitely big, uh, many countries world is a little bit different in their wine or cloth that makes this picture curved. Just like in this picture, you know, maybe um, you know, it's, it's this heterogeneity that starts to speak the possibility of a curved US-wide PPF. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. Of course, we don't need it for just white wheat. We need it for another crop too, right? So here's a second crop. In practice, we use 16. But here's the, another major one, uh, cotton. And um, of course, what Ricardo would want us to do is take the ratio and talk about the comparative advantage of every pixel at wheat relative to cotton. And that's what I'm showing you here. So this, I hope, would make Ricardo kind of you know, weep um, in his grave. It, uh, because look at this. I mean, it's completely heterogeneous, right? It tells you what we all know is obvious, which is that there's bits of the United States that are good at growing wheat and not so good at cotton. And there's bits of the United States that are good at cotton and not so good at wheat. And of course, if I were to show you the other 14 crops behind this, 14 major crops, you'd see even more heterogeneity. And so no surprise, you know, a country like the United States has tons of land heterogeneity, land that's good at wheat, not cotton, and vice versa. And you see it right here, right? Um, and so that should tell you that the scope for gains from trade within the United States, Ricardian gains from trade, should be pretty big, right? And the question is just sort of how big. So rather than asking how big are the hypothetical potential if, we were to, if the United States were to be a perfectly trading region, a free trade region, you know, which maybe it's not, because um, of things like transport costs and maybe some taxes, et cetera, um, instead of asking that hypothetical question, we decided to ask a more historical question, which is sort of how much of the growth in agricultural productivity from when the productivity data starts, 1880, to the present, how much of that 120 years in our, in our data, that's 120 years long, worth of growth was due to that process I kind of showed you, I tried to show you here. This sort of like finding points on the PPFs that are more and more conducive to aggregate gains from trade. That would show up as like the US is producing more efficiently on the whole. right? Because sort of if, as, as the South shifts more into cotton, that's like Portugal getting out of cloth and into wine, and the north shifts more into wheat and out of cotton, that's like England shifting out of wine and into cloth, we would expect the, the consumption or aggregate production value possibilities to grow. And we can ask the, the US data whether that happened. So exactly how we do that, I'm sorry I'm going to you know, have to you know, spare you uh, some of the gory details. But the basic idea was that we have US output data you know, by crop, by um, year and by county um, in these years, like 1880 to 1920. And so since we know what was produced where, you know, the, take a given county in uh, Michigan. We know how much corn and wheat and soy and, and cotton, i.e. none, they were producing, right? And we know it for every county in the United States in every census decade since the census of agriculture started in 1880 to, in this picture, 1920. And so what we can ask is sort of, is the allocation of who's producing what moving according to this map and the 16-dimensional version of it behind it, is it moving in the direction of a more efficient US-wide allocation? Right? It didn't have to. It could have moved like against that direction. Right? It, I, this could have gone either way. Um, but we were, thanks to we, the fact that we knew kind of Ricardo's four magic numbers, or Ricardo's like 18 million magic numbers in this example, we were able to kind of do it. And here I'm showing you the answer. OK, so what's the answer? Well, if, here's the answer. So uh, what this, this red line tells you is the answer um, when we ask different questions. So the most boring question of them all is the one to the right, the answer to which is 0, uh, with the red dot there to the, to the most right. The, the question that dot answers is, if you were to take the 1920 allocation and put it into the 1920 allocation, how much better would the allocation be? And the answer is obviously 0 right, because we're not changing anything. But the next one says if you were to take the 1910 uh, allocation and put it basically into the sort of the relative um, aspects of the allocation that are pertinent in 1920, economists speak that's the relative prices, basically, um, you know, then uh, how much more efficient would 1910 have been? And the dot there is, says about 0.4, but that's 0.4% of growth compounding for 10 years, which is a lot. 
And the dots get bigger. So the dot to the far left is, uh, is answering the question, if we were to take 1880 and take it to 1920, how big was the gain? The answer is 1.5% per year in terms of real output growth. And that's compounding. So that's a lot of growth. You know, the US economy as a whole, like this is like per unit land acre, maybe compare that to sort of the growth of GDP per capita in real terms. 2% a year is about as good as it gets in most, in most years. Uh, so this is a lot of growth, 1.5% per year. To put it in kind of further context, I'm just, ignore the blue line, please. I, I, I'll skip your, uh, your interest in that. But the, the green line answers a different question. It asks, you know, holding the prices constant, how much more efficient would the U.S. have been just from the fact that, of course, there was agricultural technological prog progress. You know, um, new varietals were invented, new tractors were invented, the man-made fertilizers were invented, irrigation got used more plentifully. All those things, basically, they don't shift where you are on the PPF. They move the entire PPF. They move the menu upwards. That's like manna from heaven to an economist. It's a wonderful thing. And um, yet the gains from that in our calculations are only the paltry green line there. They're actually below the red line. They're below the gains from trade. Uh, or the gains from integration, as I'm calling it here, because this is, it's, it's obviously within country, within the United States trade. So this convinced me that, you know, Ricardo's forces, at least taken to the example of U.S. agriculture, 1880 to 1920, in a Ricardian model, calibrated to fit what the agronomists think is the right kind of Ricardo's four numbers, leads to big, big effects. I was shocked. I kind of guess I'd thought that, you know, the big story about U.S. agricultural growth, which has been the fastest growing sector in the U.S. economy for the last 120 years, right? That's why we can still feed so many people with only about 1% or 2% of the workforce. Uh, you know, it's this, this tremendous productivity growth is largely to do with scientific progress, like more, you know, tractors, better tractors, better fertilizers, et cetera. But it's also to do with just better use of what we have, which is what the red line is answering uh, you know, in our calculations. And the gains continue past 1920. This is the same calculation for a later period. We can't stitch up the two periods because of some data limitations, but I can show you them both separately, which is what's shown here. And again, you know, the red line is high. It's, 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 it's very big. It's again in the ballpark of about 1.5% per year if you run it for the full uh, sort of, you know, post-war era in our data. And again, it's mostly by and large bigger than the green line. Again, this sort of just gains from trading, taking advantage of the opportunity to trade within the country to specialize according to comparative advantage is as big or if not possibly bigger than uh, the gains from just uh, you know, the scientific progress moving out the possibilities within each uh, county. Okay, so that shocked me and it, it, it sort of, um, it, it made me think that, you know, this is, this, in, these, this, um, in this, this data interpreted through the Ricardian model leads to big potential for gain, big, big potential for gains from trade being actually exploited by the U.S. economy over the last 120 years. Um, okay, so, you know, but, but obviously that's, um, that was kind of a theoretical argument. So just to be clear what I was doing there as I was sort of taking theory and taking data and sort of feeding the data through the theory to quantify the theory. Right? So, you know, it, it, but you, you, should, you should have some healthy skepticism, obviously, because, you know, it wasn't just pure data. It wasn't just pure facts. It also involved some theoretical, uh, you know, logical assumptions that, you, you know, that you know, we could rightly, rightly debate. Um, and, and obviously, you know, we, we could debate them at very high levels. We could debate them at very, at very lower, more mundane levels in terms of the exact details of how I did what I did there, uh, some of which, you know, could matter. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna now sort of stick to the theory and sort of remind you about sort of some of those assumptions that would sort of flip the, the, the Ricardian argument or the, 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 the generalized Ricardian argument we use nowadays that I've tried to sketch for you. Okay, so I've, I'm gonna be brief about this because I, you know, th there's a lot of um, details I, I don't have the time to do justice to. I wanna get to some of the facts that we know internationally about some of the experience of opening up to trade. But let me just sort of uh, try to be a little um, basic about this. Um, so, you know, when I think about uh, the argument for free trade, I often come back to, you know, maybe I'm biased, but I, I come back to this. You know, why don't we restrict trade here? You know, thank God we didn't, right? I mean, I'm telling you the gains from not doing so were big in the, in the pre-war era and the post-war era, right? Um, the, so again, I sort of always ask myself this question, you know, if I were wanting to go out for dinner um, tomorrow night at, let's call it restaurant A, uh, instead of um, some other restaurant within the United States, restaurant B, 
why would a government kind of get in my way? You know, what, what are the arguments we know of you know, for why they would want to hinder me from buying from A instead of uh, B, right? Um, you can see where this is going. Uh, let me just change the labels. So there's a restaurant called F for foreign and a restaurant called H for home, right? Same, same argument, right? I'm just sort of buying goods and services from A versus B, F versus H. So what are the sort of standard arguments that apply uh, in economics to that question? Um, well, sort of one uh, basically is, is very simple. It's, it comes down to this, that the, this government would want to hinder me if they basically care more about um, restaurant H than it does about me. You know, that is to say, uh, you know, maybe the government, you know, for whatever reason, uh, you know, uh, just, just, just actually is sort of saying, you know, we, would, we, we care a lot about restaurant H, we don't care a lot about you, the diner, and it's for that reason that we would effectively want to forbid your ability to buy from someone else. Right? That's just, it's just in our preferences. We, just, we put more weight on the H producer than the consumer, right? the diner. Right? And that maybe happens all the time. Uh, but, but obviously, we, we should call it what it is. And, and um, it's a form of redistribution. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with redistribution, obviously. Uh, but it does raise the question you know, of kind of like, is this the sort of risk redistribution that we um, that, that we think is right as a society, and maybe it is. And it also raises the second kind of economics question of whether it's the, you know, is this really the right instrument, the right policy instrument for achieving redistribution, right? So if you, know, if you, if you really wanted to help H uh, and not me, the diner, um, you know, are there not other ways to achieve redistribution? That's the question economists ask when, when posed this. And maybe the answer is no. You know, maybe unfortunately we know of no way to achieve redistribution from, uh, you know, from me, the diner, to, to restaurant H. Um, but on the other hand, you know, like, you know, most of, uh, you know, government uh, activity, it, it plays major redistributionary roles, right? Uh, that there's, um, that happens all the time, and, and so it's a little bit funny that sort of in the backdrop of that massive redistribution machinery, we kind of use these weird instruments to achieve a weird form of redistribution. That's, that's always been my view on that, but you could of course say, well, unfortunately, it's the best instrument we have. You know, that would be a, that would be a, a good argument. Um, the, uh, the second argument, uh, you know, very different, is that basically, um, the, the, the government, you know, in, in, these, in these sort of contexts of sort of, you know, basically restraining a, a consumer's ability to buy from whoever she wants or whoever, whoever I want, is um, in a sense sort of able to play the role of a kind of a, like a monopolist if, a, if the government was selling or a monopsonist, like someone who is able to control the buying, right? So a way of thinking about this is they can sort of, it's as if the government can kind of use its collective muscle. It's almost like they're a kind of, you know, like a union, a labor union kind of collectivizes to try to get a better deal for its members. The government, in principle, can, can collectivize consumption, like buying power, and, um, and basically try to get a better deal out of restaurant F from the fact that they are sort of forcing me to go to restaurant H. That's sort of a way that they could leverage their collective bargaining power. Right, so obviously governments don't do this within countries. They, you know, sometimes do it uh, across countries, and that's an argument for for protection as well. Basically, using collective might. And formally in the trade literature, this is known as the sort of so-called terms of trade mo motive for for tariff protection. It basically says we might be so big in the world that we can actually, by restraining how much we buy from the world, we can actually, you know, get the world to sell us its stuff at lower prices. It's kind of like we're using our collective bargaining power. And um, you know, some people might call this kind of winning at trade. You know, we're going to sort of win in those bar those bilateral bargains. Um, you know, the problem with winning winning at trade is that a you need to be super big. You know, so standard estimates of this sort of these sorts of forces suggest that even the United States might not be big enough to win much from these forces. And second, you need the foreign party to be a sort of passive bystander and not try to win back. And as we've seen in recent events, you know, uh, foreign parties are, are not, do not appear willing to sort of sit idle and let uh, one country raise its tariffs with also retaliating with sort of tariffs and starting a trade war, right? So if I was able to make sure the foreign party wouldn't, wouldn't try to win back, then yeah, maybe this is a good argument. But if, but if I'm worried that they might try to retaliate, then it's not such a good argument anymore. Um, that's my, you know, the, the simplistic view of that.
And then third would be, you know, that basically to an economist, you'd say that there's a market failure at home. There's an externality. Right? Um, and maybe it's the case that whenever this restaurant H um, produces, it actually produces not just the stuff, the food, but also some social good. Right? Maybe it fixes pollution whenever it produces. produces. I'm making that up, obviously. But you know, maybe it, like, there's some externality. And a common version of this is sort of a form of like increasing returns, for example. Maybe there's some social spillover that you know, whenever a producer produces, nearby producers get more productive. That's a hypothetical you know, argument for a positive externality that might be important. Um, and basically, if that's important, then it basically means that there's some, there's some externality that means that whenever I go to restaurant F, I'm not internalizing the fact that if I were instead to go to H, I would you know, get the food from restaurant H. That's fine. That's you know, not a market failure, but I would be actually by the act of buying from H promoting the the spread of that you know positive spillover that positive externality and that would be an argument in standard economic thinking for the government trying to nudge me towards doing more of the H and less of the F right so that um, you know again it's a, it's a coherent argument um, it, it uh, and and you know in a sense another no, another word for it is is that it's a form of protection as industrial policy, right? So we you uh, you know countries have over the years tried to use what's often called industrial policy to target when when they think there's a setting like a producer that when it produces creates positive externalities. Uh, you know industrial policy is the name we give to the idea that we should sort of try to nudge consumers to buy more from that positive externality producing sector, and um, you know the the the, the bottom line on this is that, you know, again, if you thought like the bottom, the, 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 the basic principle here is that restaurant H should be bigger because it's underproducing because it's not taking account of all its positive spillovers, you know, there's lots of ways to try to make restaurant H bigger. It's nothing, you know, sort of tilting foreign consumption is a very, very poor form of domestic industrial policy because most production is for domestic purposes. So if you wanted to sort of make the guys with the positive spillovers bigger, you should make them bigger via kind of domestic means, you would think, to kind of at least to I think plausible first order magnitudes. So again, it's kind of like, yeah, it's a reasonable argument, but it might, it might, it's sort of a little bit of a mis misplaced argument because, uh, you know, if you really were worried about industrial policy concerns, industrial policy is the usual fix for those kinds, kinds of issues. Um, okay, so, you know, the, and, and furthermore, I would say that the, those big positive externality spillovers are, you know, the kinds of things about which empirical work is still trying to settle. They might be enormous. They're, they're incredibly hard to measure, so we just sort of don't really know. They might be enormous. They might not. We, we're still trying to figure out. But um, it is not kind of a priori obvious that sort of, uh, you know, the, the kinds of things that you, you know, that, that it's easy to find the activities at home that are clearly the site of big positive externalities. And so it's clearly extremely hard to target industrial policy and even harder to target border policy, tariff policy, as a form of kind of second best industrial policy. Um, so it's sort of a it's a it's a theoretical argument, but I think in practice it, it's going it's a hard argument to pull off. It's my own opinion on that. Um, okay, so you know the, as you can see, I, I've tried to sort of argue that there there are three good reasons here why protection might be a good idea. The first one is sort of more about social justice and redistribution. Um, the second two are really about like we would expect that if they are strong, that countries that protect would be richer. Right, that they would be, though both of those features would turn up as like aggregate wealth, aggregate GDP, aggregate income would be higher in protected countries if forces number two and three were really, were really the, 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 the salient feature of the world. Um, and so that leads me to uh, the last thing I'll talk about, which is sort of the international experience. Um, <clears throat> and so, the, you know, the, the, unfortunately, the, um, you know, the, this is not easy, as I've now said three times. The, uh, you know, the, it's not going to be easy to try to find corners of the world that, um, that, you know, because of completely idiosyncratic, as if experimental random reasons just sort of suddenly change their trading behavior. And so economists, research economists and otherwise, have for the last, uh, you know, kind of 30, 40 years now at least, tried to isolate settings where we think we might be able to Learn something, right? And I'll I'll tell you about that. So you know this is um, as I hope is, you know it's provocative, but um, but I hope it's clear that this is not going to settle the debate. I mean, this is telling you that um, on the y-axis is the annual growth rate over sort of 40 years leading up to the year 2000. On the um, you know the y-axis is the x-axis is actually not relevant for this, but it shows you just. Um, the broadness of this fact. 
that sort of the black dots, the ones that are the more open half of the world's countries, are higher on the y-axis, that is, they've had more growth since 1960, than, this, than the circle dots, the, the empty dots. And uh, that tells you that kind of on average, over that 40-year experience, and this, this fact is still true if you run it to 2018, um, the relatively open countries of the world have grown faster. Right, so that's, that's just a, that, and that's true kind of at lots of base income levels. It's not just a statement about the initially poor or the initially rich. Um, so that's, of course, you know, that's a provocative fact. It tells you that on average, like, more open countries are richer. But, you know, it's just a simple correlation, right? We could think of lots of other reasons why maybe a country, uh, you know, that was going to grow fast anyway just was, was open. You know, maybe it's just, it's part of their their culture or their, or their tastes or the, some other reason that um, they decided to be both open and were successful at growing fast in GDP terms uh, for maybe lots of other reasons, right? So it's just a correlation. Um, so is this, this is a slightly different one, but this tells you that the countries that have traded more uh, over that roughly that same time period have, are also the countries that have grown faster over that, over that time period, right? So it's sort of a, you know, a difference, a time difference version of that. That sort of on average, there's a pretty strong correlation between those two uh, characteristics of countries. The, the trading, the, the ones with faster trade growth and the ones with faster GDP growth. GDP growth. But again, of course, you know, there could be other things that these countries did that made them both trade more and grow more, right? Uh, and that other thing is really what we should be trying to study, not trade. A trade is just something that follows whatever that other thing, you know, is. Um, okay, so that's going to sort of um, lead me to what, uh, you know, we re research economists call, kind of fancifully, I suppose you could say, a natural experiment. You know, we know that for questions this big, we can't run really big lab slash field experiments where we randomize countries or regions of the country into free trade zones and non-free trade zones and stuff. You know, we wish, obviously, we could do that, uh, that ridiculous social experiment, but we know we can't. And, um, and obviously, we don't really wish we could do it. Uh, but, we, um, but we do, uh, you know, try to find episodes of world history that have led to um, changes in the, grow in the trading environment. And I'm going to now talk about five of those. Um, starting with, uh, and, but just to warn you, they're, they're, none of them is going to be perfect. I mean, what we wish we had was just a country that just immediately changed its tariffs and in such a stark way that we could figure out what impact that had. Uh, I'll, I'll show you attempts to get to that, get, try to get to that, but, um, but they, you know, unfortunately the world's not clean enough for that to really work, as I just stated it. So we're going to look at other types of events, too, that I think are completely relevant to this debate, you know, which is to sort of start by thinking about transportation infrastructure. There are lots of things that impede trade, not just tariffs. Um, you know, as Joan Robinson once said, it's, it's kind of just as crazy to impose tariffs as it is to put rocks in your harbor, right? She said, uh, you know, no country builds harbors and then fills them up with rocks. That would impede trade. If you wanted to impede trade, just put rocks in your harbor. Don't, you know, why would you want to impose taxes on trade if you don't also want to put rocks in your harbor? Kind of riffing on that, we're going to look at uh, opening up to trade within the United States given by railroads, kind of like the removal of grist in the mill of trading. Right? We're going to also going to look at that internationally, things like the Suez Canal that led to more trade. Um, Air shipping technologies improving that led to more trade. And uh, I'll tell you what, what, what we can learn from those kinds of technological changes. And then finally, I'll, I'll turn to borders and tariffs. Um, so this is some work I did with uh, Rick Hornbeck at, at, at Chicago. And um, this is a map of um, the US uh, sort of high-speed travel network as it was in 1870. So by high-speed travel, I mean railroads that were open in 1870. You can see the, the transcontinental there. And um, water travel. So drawn here are all the lakes, all the oceans, and all the river, navigable rivers and waterways, canals, by, uh, eight, open by 1870. And you know, this was already pretty good, but remarkably, uh, by um, 1890, it looked like this. You know, as, you, as you can see, much denser, right? much more penetration. And that's what railroads did. They basically expanded the high-speed network and just put it, like, everywhere. Uh, everywhere that was, you know, flat and feasible, basically. Uh, and densely populated and fer full of fertile land. Um, okay, so that, Rick and I wanted to sort of run a statistical analysis that would try to basically ask, um, you know, in a typical county, 
when the railroad network changed in this, the, over this, these two decades, by the way, these two decades are like the big railroad building decades, that's why we focused on them. Um, we wanted to ask the question of in a typical county, average county for the United States in, in this time period, how much did economic life change when the railroad kind of came to town, right? Um, came to your county, and that's, that's what we did. But there's one little subtlety there, which is that obviously the world is not so simple as just, you know, did the railroad go through your county in, by 1890 or not? You know, railroads are more sophisticated than that. It matters where they take you, right? It matters, uh, you know, and it all, also it's a little bit tricky because as, as um, some of the early uh, economists who wrote about railroads highlighted, there's this risk that um, actually railroads could be bad for you because maybe they actually help your competitor towns uh, kind of steal your lunch, like sort of, you know, th they can now trade more efficiently with the markets that you used to trade to, right? So there's sort of trilateral effects that one also has to think about. Okay, so we sort of, with the help of a little bit of theory, so-called gravity theory, uh, nothing to do with physics, but that we call it gravity theory anyway, we uh, developed a, a, a concept or, you know, uh, leveraged prior work on a concept called market access. The basic idea of which is just, you know, you can summarize what a railroad did for a county by asking how much cheaper is it now to get to every market in the U.S. economy, right? So that's, that's what we could calculate for every county. And um, if you scatter, this is, a, you know, what comes out of that analysis. So for every county you, on the y-axis, you can plot the change in their, the, land, the value of their land between 1870 and 1890. I guess Henry George would like this. Against the x-axis, the, the, the change in their market access. These are in logs. That just tells you this is going to be it's in proportional changes. But um, the change in their market access, that idea I sort of ask you to think about is basically how much cheaper, thanks to the railroads and waterways and canals, is it now for me to get to every other part of the United States? Um, and we're, we're sort of comparing your, these counties' change in land value with their change in market, access, in market access. And as you can see, they're very tightly in logs, linearly correlated. Uh, you, can, you can strongly predict how a country's land value will change uh, via how much its market access change because of railroads. And in, you know, in, in the work, obviously, we subject that to a bunch of different statistical tests, but the, the bottom line is kind of always ends up looking pretty similar to this, that uh, you know, places look richer. That is, the value of their land has gone up. That is, it's kind of a, you know, obviously, as, as George would have said, it's a, it's, it's a fixed factor you know, that cannot be moved. So if that place is getting better, we have to expect the price of that fixed factor to increase, right? And that is what you're seeing exactly there, that as uh, the railroads opened up the West and, the, and uh, other parts of the country, um, these results are true, by the way, in sort of all regions of the U.S. It's not just a Midwestern thing. Um, the, uh, you know, land was worth more. It's as if, like, the economy is worth more. The, uh, the incomes are higher. Wealth is higher uh, in the places that were opened up by market access. Um, something similar is, tr is sort of relatedly true in um, the international environment. So this is the work of Jim, uh, James Feirer. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, I'm going to talk about two of his recent papers that have tried to ask, tried to find settings of the world where countries have traded more. Okay, so he looks at countries that kind of in a sense had favorable geography positioning on the earth for air trade relative to their geographical, geographic positioning for sea trade, right? So think of the example of like trading between San Francisco and Tokyo, right? Whether you take the sea route or the air route, it's the same distance, right? You just take the straight line. But think about trading from sort of, uh, you know, uh, Tokyo to, um, um, to London. Obviously, the sea route is very circuitous, right, depending on which canals are open, et cetera, but it's quite circuitous, whereas the air route is straight, right? So he, he sort of basically calculated this variable on the x-axis here, which he called the air and sea distance difference, which tells you for a country drawn there like Korea to the top right, um, its difference in, it's, change, it's the difference for that country in its air distance relative to its sea distance for, between it, Korea, and every other country in the world. So it's asking sort of like, did Korea have a positioning in the world's geography that was relatively going to benefit from the advent of air shipping, right? Because suddenly, in the 60s, we could ship stuff by air, right? Prior to the 60s, you had to take the long sea route. And as you can imagine, Korea would benefit a lot from that, right? The, the rise of air travel, air shipping, and air travel. And as you can see, Korea's GDP went up a lot more than other countries in the world in exactly the period in which air shipping went crazy. Um, and this, that, that relationship between the change in 
distance, in effect, which is the air-sea distance difference. And GDP change, which is the y-axis, is pretty, uh, there's also there a pretty strong correlation around the world. The countries that had the best positioning for the rise of air travel had the biggest, on average, GDP growth over this time period. So this doesn't necessarily, obviously, say that trade caused this. I mean, you know, there's a lot of evidence that air shipping did you know, get happen and get cheaper and go crazy in this time period. And the countries that are closer and benefited more from that did trade more and all that. But of course, you know, all of that is just saying that, yeah, this happened. The, the thing on the x-axis here happened. The thing on the y-axis here, here thing happened. Uh, you know, there are stories probably related to air travel, air trading that, that caused this. But it doesn't necessarily say it's trade. But it does tell us that it's something about, you know, the connectivity of nations. Um, that, is, that is important and that, you know, that drove a lot of GDP growth over this time period. Related to that, uh, a second paper by Campante and Yanagizawa Drott recently looked at the fact that basically air travel, like passenger air travel, basically has, until recently, a hard limit on traveling more than 6,000 miles. So, for example, from traveling from SFO in San Francisco, this is the, uh, the, the solid red line is the set at the, it's kind of the boundary line for a direct flight until quite recently. Uh, until you know, um, plane um, technology meant that you could go, you could exceed seven, six thousand miles. This is a restriction on how long pilots are allowed to fly, basically. So, okay, so what he's going to ask is, well, you know, if there's some benefit of air connection here, then you would expect that sort of um, that that there, you know, we can compare the cities that, in a sense, are just on the close side of the six thousand mile limit, with the cities that are just on the far side, right? Uh, and that is our, our we, we probably think that like that boundary, it's obviously not a real boundary. It's just a sort of hypothetical boundary, right? It's just this, this line in the 6,000 mile sand. But we think that the economic consequences of being on one side of the boundary versus the other could be quite real if air shipping and air travel is important. And that's exactly what um, they showed. So this is an example zooming in on all cities that sort of are um, on average, uh, somewhere between 5,000 and 7,000 miles from every other city in the world. The cities that are just over 6,000 uh, are poorer. They're 15% poorer than the cities that are just to the left, just under 6,000. So it's as if you know, you know, we're just comparing cities that are close in this, this metric, this completely arbitrary kind of, it's not a border, it's just a, but evidently there's something real there. So they're 15% poorer, and what I'm showing here too is one possible reason they're poorer is that there are fewer kind of bilateral foreign firm ownership links for, measured from a data set that has all, four, uh, all global foreign ownership links in it. Uh, massive drop in foreign ownership links at distances about which, beyond which you know, people cannot travel via direct travel. So if you, if you sort of think that human connectivity is important for the world, uh, then you're, you're kind of right. That's what this is saying. Now, is human connectivity just due to trade, or is it due to other things like foreign investment that are obviously highly correlated with trade? Uh, we don't know. All we know is that just like being on the right side of that border is uh, really good for foreign ownership and investments and other things, and in the end also is good for, for sort of GDP, as, as much as 15%. Um, another experiment that someone uh, that, that people have worked on, this again back to Jim Fire and different work, was the Suez Canal. Right, it, it famously closed uh, in the 60s during the, the war and reopened um, uh, seven years later to, uh, when the war ended. And during the war, the Suez Canal was closed. Right, so all shipping couldn't go through the Suez Canal. So in the top left here are country pairs that never would have traded via the Suez Canal anyway. And I'm plotting their their trade flows like over the time period before and after the, the Suez War. And as you can see, those countries aren't affected. Trade flows barely budged. But on the bottom right, and, and this sort of, the, the, the quadrants are ordered in this direction, on the bottom right is what happened to trade between country pairs that were heavily dependent on the Suez Canal. Their, their straight line via the Suez Canal over sea shipping was much, much, much shorter than their shortest non-Suez Canal route. And as you can see, they traded much less when the war started and got back to much more trade when the war ended. And that plausibly led to changes in GDP too. So these are all the countries in the world. Uh, and on the x-axis again is the change in their distance. This is the change in their Suez distance, right? So when the Suez closes, distance gets shorter. And when she, Suez reopens, distance gets longer. Um, and what's plotted on the y-axis is a change in their GDP. And as you can see, there's, again, this is a, a noisier scatter plot. There's not that many countries that were affected by the Suez thing, thankfully. But uh, those that were, 
display the, display the same pattern, that the people that were more affected saw their GDP fall more. When it reopened, they saw their GDP rise more. Um, so again, if you, and, you know, I don't think this is to do with air travel, that no, but, you know, or business travel. Business, business people didn't take the, the boats anyway in this time period. This is plausibly really to do with trade, and it, and it lines up in magnitudes with some of the earlier studies too. Um, we can look at like the closing of a border. So this is the, the West German border, uh, the West, West Germany. I'm sorry, you can't probably see it, but uh, the, the circle dots in West Germany are all cities above a certain size. And the, the, the square dots are the ones that are within 100 kilometers, sorry, 75 kilometers of the East German border. Of course, what happened in, in, uh, when Germany um, divided is that those towns that are close in the west but close to the east lost the ability to trade and interact and do lots of other good things with the towns that used to be close to them in the east. And lo and behold, if you sort of track what's shown here as a so-called treatment group, those are western German towns close to the border, their populations kind of stopped growing. They didn't keep pace with all other cities in western Germany. So again, I don't know if this is due to trade, you know, no one does, but this tells us that sort of proximity to others is good, right? People don't want to be, um, you know, far from others. They don't want to be near this border that meant they were therefore far from others, right? Um, Finally, I'll turn to tariffs. So this is an example from Brazil's tariff uh, trade liberalization of 1991. Tariffs fell by somewhere between 5 and 20% in all of these kind of manufacturing and tradable commodity industries. And they basically suddenly liberalized tariffs. And what we wish we could study here is um, the nationwide consequences of this tariff reform, right? Uh, just like how much did GDP fall or rise when tariffs fell? That would be what we wish we could study. Unfortunately, that, this is just too noisy for that. To pick this up at the national level, uh, you know, we, there would just be no precision on it. Um, so what uh, these authors, Dix Carnero and Kovac, have done instead is sort of split it up regionally and compare regions that used to have an employment share that was extremely exposed to the tariff drop, those guys are in yellow, with uh, regions that were producing, their employees were in, in industries that weren't much exposed to the tariff drop, those guys are in dark blue. And as you can see, Brazil is pretty you know, heterogeneous in that regard. Some are quite exposed, some are not. And what you should expect here is you know, exposure to foreign trade competition is, a, is not going to be good right, for these regions. Right? There, or at least your, I think your prior should be that it's not going to be good. It's kind of like asking, how will England's wine producers do when England opens up to trade with Portugal? Right? They're going to suffer. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're opening up to trade. They're in the comparative disadvantage industry. They're going to, they're going to suffer. Here we're just focusing on the, ones whose t the industries whose tariffs fell more. So if you were pre-specialized in high tariff reduction industries, you're going to have more foreign competition. That's going to lead to suffering. And, 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 it, and it does. And, and that's what we've learned from this experiment. Uh, this is the drop in worker earnings. This adds up to about a 30% drop in, 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 uh, in relative earnings of the yellow regions to the, um, to the blue regions in this picture. So this is tracking the same workers over time from 1999, 1991 onwards to today. And so this is, you know, this is important to, to talk about because this is, tells you that like, the serious harm to uh, the comparative disadvantage, you know, any producer who's sort of specialized in the comparative disadvantage industry, if they can't get out and get to the comparative advantage industry and start producing cloth in England uh, or producing whatever you know, did well in Brazil as a result of the liberalization, they're going to suffer. And so we've learned a lot lately about that suffering. And you can see the example of the Brazilian suffering here. This by no means tells us that like, the economy as a whole was poorer from this. It just tells us that the ones you'd kind of expect to be harmed were harmed, and, and that's a serious harm. Um, and, and as you know, uh, because that was the topic of this lecture last year, uh, my colleague David Otter, along with uh, Dorn and Hansen and Song, has documented something similar in the United States, that it's, it's not a tariff reform, it's the rise of Chinese imports, but a similar story, tracking similar, like the same worker over time in social security records. Uh, this, this drop here adds up to over the, um, of comparing workers in, who were in 1991 uh, were in industries that over the 90s and 2000s were going to have a lot of Chinese penetration, import penetration, relative to workers who weren't. That's what's being plotted here. You see the workers that were exposed see their earnings, uh, you know, cumulative earnings fall. Obviously, cumulative has to fall because it's cumulative, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's falling, it's continuing to fall, which means that it, their, their earnings stay low. 
Um, and that, that added up cumulative effect is as big as 40% of one year's earnings, right? So over 20 years, it's, it, it's, it's as if it's like 2% per year. It's, uh, it's big on average. And so again, we know a lot about the harm that, is, is, that can be done to the kinds of sectors that are being harmed by openness to trade. Um, but you know, the question that I always ask, that I always ask myself is that is to just with respect to that is just to remember that, of course, you know, economies are doing harm all the time. Um, you know, "Video Killed the Radio Star" was a popular song in my youth. Uh, well, I won't. I was too young for that song. I mean, I'm too young to, for that song, obviously. But uh, but you probably heard of it. Uh, "Video Killed the Radio Star," right? So we're familiar with the idea that uh, technological progress, the invention of video, will harm people who are specialized in in activities that that are being, uh, for whatever reason, uh, sort of displaced. And, and that kind of harm is is very real in the U.S. economy. So this picture um, is from the work of von von Factor and uh, Song and Manchester, looking at um, in the average major kind of layoff event in the US economy in the 80s, what is the sort of the effect on, again, tracking the same individual workers and averaging over them, what's the effect on their, their earnings over sort of even 20 years after a layoff, right? And you can see the immediate drop around the date of the layoff. And you can see some return as they sort of regain, uh, you know, opportunities in employment. But there's per there's sort of 20-year long permanent scarring there, right? So there's there's real harm. This is nothing to do with trade, though. This is just like daily life. This is just you know the layoffs in the 80s. There there's um, you know four uh, percent every quarter. Four percent of U.S. jobs are are lost to involuntarily due to the workers, right? So all the time we're seeing churn. All of the time we're kind of seeing. Uh, little day-to-day -day examples of like radio stars being displaced by video and 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 other reasons why f kind of the economy adjusts and that always leaves scarring. We we increasingly know from recent work, and so kind of trade shocks are leading to scarring in Brazil of those who are affected, and they're leading to scarring in uh, the U.S. of those who are affected, and so are other shocks too. You know, unfortunately. That's a fact of kind of economic life. And, um, and it's a fact that we need to do something about. It's a fact that requires action and, and uh, you know, uh, a form, a system that sort of tries to minimize this scarring and tries to shelter those who are harmed due to events outside their control. You know, the people who are lucky enough not to be scarred, the, the, one, the people who watch the video, the people who buy, who buy at restaurant F, kind of owe it to, to, to the, the ones who suffer to find ways to compensate them, right? To sort of compensate the radio stars, compensate the owners of restaurant H when I choose instead to buy rest at restaurant F, and con con compensate the, the workers who are scarred by the fact that they were concentrated in industries that were harmed by the, in, the import penetration of China. As you can see, that compensation is incomplete, and, and we need to do something about it. But we need to do something about it, I think, in terms of all forms of this sort of scarring. Um, that's how I come down on, on these sorts of issues um, on the whole. So just to sort of step back and summarize, uh, I have tried to sort of recap the theoretical argument for uh, free trade at the very, very lofty level of Ricardo. Um, I've tried to put numbers on that, and I've tried to show you that they're relatively big. I've tried to remind you of the important uh, you know, logical reasons why Ricardo's logic might not apply always and everywhere. Um, I've tried to remind you that you know, a lot of those questions come down to, well, is trade any different? Would we also, by those same logics, want to impede domestic progress? Would we also want to put rocks in our harbors? If your natural instinct is kind of no, then you should think twice about the logic for uh, protectionism. And I've tried to talk about how across countries, uh, the countries that have found ways to open up more uh, via the sort of technological improvements I showed you have tended to grow much faster over the sort of post-World War II era. And that's kind of, I see as broadly supportive for the fact that the gains from, overall gains from trading are pretty big in line with what I kind of expected in the theory. But just like with any economic shock, I think we owe it to ourselves to remember that this is going to lead to displacement. It's going to lead to plausibly scarring and cost of adjustment. And for this shock and any other shock, we need to find ways of uh, mitigating that damage. And, uh, um, and in that sense, I think trade is kind of no different. We need to find ways to deal with it. I'll stop there. Thank you for your uh, attention. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dave Donaldson. Uh, we have some uh, time for questions, uh, and there is a microphone, so 
Okay. Okay, so if there are any questions, please uh, raise your hand. We will have some time for questions. Uh, Paul. What about the creation of the European Union? That sounds like a, seems like a natural experiment. Um, yeah, I, I agree. That's, uh, that's a great example. Um, I, I'm familiar with some work on that. Uh, the, you know, the, the, that work, unfortunately, uh, um, you, you know, suffered from two problems you can probably uh, you know, imagine. That, you know, one is that, unfortunately, the European Un Union did many things, right? And so, again, we sort of, we learn about integration uh, writ large, uh, political integration and otherwise. What it says about, and, and that package of, of, of interventions led to effects that we can study, but we wouldn't necessarily know how much of that package was purely due to trade, right? And so it's, it's informative. And there is work on that, but again, unfortunately, the, the, the change was kind of so um, gradual that, uh, because it was phased in, that, um, that actually the, the raw data plots of how typical countries were affected by that, I, in, to my reading of the data, don't look super persuasive. You know, it's, it's just, just unfortunately that's a fact of life. You know, when you were studying something noisy uh, with an intervention that's not huge, what you see will be, might be swamped by the noise. And you know, things like GDP are super noisy. They they vary for lots of reasons that we don't you know that are not just the event. So unfortunately, we kind of need a, an experiment with a very large signal to noise ratio in a sense. And that wasn't unfortunately a great one for that. There's potential hope that you know, if certain countries joined the EU, you know, they acceded to the EU. That might be, have been a more dramatic and sudden shock for certain countries. That uh, I'm not familiar with work on that, but there probably is. I, I should know. I'll, I'll try to find it. Thanks. That's one coming. Hi, uh, thank you for speaking tonight. My name is JT. A uh, question I have is, if you were given the keys to the economic policy of the US in regards to trade, what, what do you like? What would you like to see if you had uh, control over that area of our economy? Um, you know, the evidence and the theory convinces me that you know, we should, I think, pursue a simple strategy of, of free trade. You know, I, I don't see huge gains from trying to sort of tinker in the corners and find like the possible opportunities in the vast complexities of the product space where we might be able to kind of either do effective redistribution or kind of win at trade, find great bargains, or uh, fix domestic market failures via a form of trade policies and industrial policy. I just, my gut instinct would be that like, Finding that and doing that right is basically extremely challenging, and I'd be much more likely to do less harm by just pursuing a, a blanket free trade policy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If you have questions, send me an email. I'd love to answer them. Thanks. Perfect. No. How about someone else? Of course, yeah. All right, so